Great. All right. Is it showing up for you both? Screen share? Yes. There yes. we are. And it's recording. Great. All right. Welcome, everyone that's tuning in. We'll get started in just a second here. Can you open the door for Leo? <laughs> Uh, give everybody just a moment to roll on in. It looks like it's populating pretty quick and then we'll get started. Yeah, enjoy this gorgeous photo of um, native sages and grasses while we wait. Happy uh, 1st of July also. Oh my <laughs> gosh. Really right. early in summer, yeah. Here <laughs> we are, July. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks everyone who has tuned in. Um, we're so glad you're joining us for Choosing Plants. This is uh, such a great topic and one we received lots and lots of requests for. Um, and before I begin, I'll just do some introductions. So I'm David Bryant. I'm the Campaigns and Engagement Manager for the California Native Plant Society. And CNPS is a statewide organization that conserves and celebrates native plants. We do that through so many different efforts. Um, and horticulture is one of my favorite because it's a gateway that all of us can uh, enter into a shared love of the environment, into making some fabulous changes in your garden for habitat, uh, for water conservation, for so many reasons. And so tonight we're focusing on choosing plants and all the factors that go into it. I'm joined by Anne Marie and Maya. They're both our fabulous horticulture team. And they'll be talking a little bit later uh, tonight in our sections here. Um, and before we get rolling, just a couple bits of housekeeping. We have a question and answer function as well as the chat. If you have a question or uh, insight or an idea to just share with everyone, go ahead and put it in the chat. If you have a question for a panelist in particular or for, for, for the three of us uh, in particular, please put it in that Q&A and we'll get to it uh, during the program. All right, here we go. So uh, our schedule for this evening is broken up into three parts. Uh, and we have inspiration as number one. I get to, I get to talk about that. Um, Anne Marie will be talking about tools, so tools you can use to start honing down your selections and, and choosing the right plants. And then Maya is gonna talk about knowing your site. So getting really accustomed and familiar to your garden, to your patio or your balcony, um, you know, just the place that you call home and the place that you garden uh, at will start to understand how we can familiarize ourselves with it and use that knowledge to inform our plant selections. All right, so here we go. I'm just gonna keep on talking because it's my, my part here. So first things first is inspiration, right? We have to get inspired. Uh, and to do that, it's all about seeing native plants in context and experiencing native plants outdoors. Um, and this is the funnest part, right? Because we wanna see what native plants excite us, what we're attracted to, and perhaps most importantly, see what calls the environment home, uh, the home that you share, because that's going to be the best plants to support habitat in your area and to grow in your climate. So we'll kind of get into that. But I want to share a couple of um, aspects and approaches that I've certainly used in, in my years of native plant gardening. Um, and they're, they're just ways to start to see native plants in designs, in, in the wild, in all of these different contexts. And you can draw inspiration um, at all of these places and approaches that I'm about to share. So one I want to talk about is public gardens. I came from the botanic garden world down at uh, California Botanic Garden in Claremont. And these three I've listed here, these are, these are some of the, the, the best known botanic gardens that focus specifically on native plants. But there are so many across the state that either have a specific native plant collection or whose main focus is native plants. And so, you know, just look at these gorgeous pictures, right? Go to these botanic gardens uh, and you'll see native plants in so many different uh, contexts. And Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, for instance, has lots of different types of lawns using different types of native plants. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. You can see um, different ornamental grasses being used. You can even see yarrow. Um, being used in a lawn context. But, you know, look at this gorgeous uh, view of the mountains that you see when you walk into Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. You're seeing all these wonderful layers and colors um, all the way up to the gorgeous tree canopies. So, 
so much to start thinking about and looking at when you explore, you know, pay attention to um, the masses you're seeing, how many plants are being planted, that's a factor. The colors, not only of the flowers, but of the foliage interplaying with one another. Um, see how plants are grouped together. Uh, just keep your eyes open as you kind of walk through the garden and, and suss things out and see what excites you and what inspires you. Um, because we have over, you know, 5,000, over 6,000 really native plant taxa in the state. Um, and so there's so many to choose from. Um, and it's great to see them play out across these landscapes. So one resource I want to point you to is the American Horticultural Society. And you go to their website, they have a list of all uh, participating botanic gardens uh, by state. So you can click on California and you can see uh, what gardens uh, to visit. And, and also there's a wonderful reciprocal admissions program. So if you purchase a membership to a botanic garden near you, say you live in Santa Barbara Botanic Garden and you uh, purchase a membership there, you can visit a lot of the other California-based gardens for free. So it's a great resource to take advantage of. Uh, and I can't recommend these gardens enough for just seeing native plants uh, at, in, at a mature stage uh, and in really wonderful and thoughtful contexts in, in beautiful different demonstration gardens. Uh, so another great resource I wanna point you to is our CNPS demonstration gardens. So we have 35 chapters throughout the state and some of them actually host their own or tend their own demonstration gardens. Uh, you're looking at here the Point Vicente Interpretive Center uh, demonstration garden down in, down in our South Coast chapter. And so in these cases, our, our CNPS volunteers are actually tending and taking care of these places which are open to the public. I also just wanna say, find what chapter area you are in. You can find that out uh, at cnps.org uh, because the chapter websites have awesome resources for, for local uh, parks, botanic gardens, um, even public spaces to, to visit. So look at the chapter websites. Uh, many times they have great resources for exploring uh, native plants in various areas, whether that's cultivated or, or out in, uh, out in our uh, wildlands. Another resource is our 360 garden tours. These were launched in the spring during Native Plant Week. And so you could do this right after the webinar. Jump onto these links uh, and you'll be able to uh, hop into over 10 gardens in, in real 360 degrees. So you can actually walk through the gardens and start to see how each of these uh, cultivators or gardeners have uh, gone about and approached native plants. And there's so many ways, as you'll see in these 360 tours. Um, and I also wanted to call out our San Diego chapter because they made uh, about four to five tours in there. They are equally stellar, they're fabulous. So hop into those tours and you can see native plants in context and you can click on some interpretation uh, on the specific plants that you'll encounter in those 360 tours. So uh, just a, a wonderful kind of supplement to your forays out into the world um, to see native plants in context. And of course, perhaps most importantly is venture outdoors. Go out and experience native plants uh, where they grow. And all these photos that I'm about to show you are just from my own personal um, excursions or trips. Um, and of course, these are, I'm reflecting places all, all over the state, but I have my own treasure trove of images I've taken of the Chaparral where I used to live down in Claremont and now I'm getting situated up here in Sacramento and going out to wildlands here to understand what plants uh, exist around me. And even more so than that, uh, you, 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 know, you certainly get to see what species occur around you, but you get to see nature has these beautiful patterns that unfold. And some of the best designs of gardens you know, come directly from what nature is showing us. So even in this image, you start to see these beautiful drifts Landscape designers will call these drips or masses of plants. So you have these uh, Western sword ferns in the background. You have uh, carex, this, this grass. Uh, you have sorrel, this um, clover plant down here that just creates this beautiful ground cover. So you can start to understand, you know, the canopy cover that you might have if you live in the North Coast area and you're under shade, you know, visiting parks and places uh, like the Redwood Forest, you can start to understand not only the plants around you, but some of the aesthetics. So, I mean, this is just, you know, superlative Fern Canyon here. If any of you try to make a garden look like this, please invite me over because I'd love to see it. Um, <laughs> so 
Uh, this is Anza Borrego. Um, you know, you can see here, there's just great sense of color, of course, it's a super bloom, but also just a sense of structure. You have these sub shrubs. These are actually, I think, um, our Ancilia farinosa, our um, California sunflower. Um, and then you have a bladder pod, which is a great plant to consider. It blooms almost year round. But you can start to see some of the hierarchy here, you know, how you can think about the layering of plants and the sizes to choose to create these really pleasing effects, right? This is really pleasing on the eye. Uh, this is uh, this is actually where close to where very close to where I live in Claremont. Um, but the chaparral with these Ceanothus uh, California lilacs just gloriously blooming. Um, and you know, just really great to kind of see that plant in context and see what it might look like if you plant it in your yard. Um, out in Joshua Tree, uh, just, I mean, how wonderful, right? Especially in our deserts, you have these succulent sculptural like plants like the Mojave Yucca here. Um, and those are so wonderful to intersperse between, you know, drifts of these kind of ground covers and annual wildflowers. So wonderful patterns to pick up and you, you'll figure out what, you know, resonates with you, what resonates with the land that you live on. And it's just wonderful to start to synthesize those. And I'm excited for Anne-Marie and Mai to talk about, you know, the exact ways to do that. So I'll breeze a little bit quicker through here. This is just, uh, you know, gorgeous meadow and starting to go into oak woodland. And then lastly, find your style. So this is gonna, this is gonna jump into Anne-Marie's uh, talk just a little bit, but I, I wanted to say that, you know, with so many plants, native plants can fit any garden style. Um, and these, these diagrams come directly from our Calscape Garden Planner. Um, and Anne-Marie's gonna talk about Calscape in a minute, which is like just the best tool to figure out the plants that are specific to your region. And the Calscape Garden Planner uh, is, a, is kind of a built-in app to Calscape. And it's, it's wonderful because it's a very easy set of questions to use, but in it, you can identify the style that really resonates to you. Perhaps you live in an HOA community, uh, perhaps you're really into the kind of chic, modern, contemporary aesthetic. Well, kind of select those options in the Calscape Garden Planner and it will present you with a suite of these designs that just show you the, the flexibility and breadth that native plants can have. They can really accommodate any garden style, uh, not just naturalistic. Of course, they shine in that, in that setting, but they can be used across the board. So, um, so yeah, I just want to end on inspiration by saying, you know, look at both your experiences out in the environment that's just the perfect place to start and then start to explore public gardens and the built environment to see how other people have uh, used it and you can start using tools which we'll get right into to like the calscape garden planner to see what kind of fits your specific style um, because native plants are just so versatile um, all right so i've talked quite enough um, but we're going to head over to tools with Anne marie all right, thank you, David. That was a great way to talk about it. If you could go into the next slide. So if you go, one of the best ways to find plants that will thrive is as David mentioned, going out and taking a walk or going to inspirational sites near you and finding styles or plants that you really like. So what happens when you find this bright orange flower and you want to learn all about it? What you want to figure out what it is, is it appropriate for where you're at, where can you buy it, all of those things. So I'm going to walk you through a couple of the tool options that will help you to determine what you're seeing, or if you want to find what, start with your site and find what's appropriate for your site. So we're going to talk about how to think about finding the plants for your location. So next slide, please. So one of the best ones out there is an app called iNaturalist. It is a terrific version of citizen science. And I use it, or the next one we're gonna show you, all the time. It's a way to go out and identify plants, take photos of plants, upload them into areas. It additionally helps scientists to track, for CNPS right now, we're tracking what comes in after fire. We're, so that on iNaturalist, there's a CNPS fire followers app. There are ones where people are tracking where we're seeing um, monarchs all kinds of different pieces are being tracked in there, but it's a great tool to help you figure out what plant you're seeing. You can see the next slide. And so this is the other version of, that iNaturalist has. It's called Seek. 
And I keep it on my phone. I keep it with me when I go outside and I take walks or whatever um, to figure out what, what it is that I'm seeing. And it'll start you at, out at, it's a monocot or a dicot, you know, it's a grass or it's a tree or it's a shrub. And then it'll start narrowing it down. And it often helps you get to or very close to what you're looking at. And it gives you a way to be like, I really love that purple thing that's flowering down the street right now. Find out what it is. Gives you a great way to see what's growing in your area too. If you're taking those nature hikes and you want to really document what's in your area and take it back home with you and be like, this is the list that I just saw. And this is kind of what I want to recreate in my yard or how I want to reconsider my yard. So starting with the yard, you can go to the next slide. The other, one of the other tools is Cowscape. And I'm gonna pop out of this and I'm going to go and show you a new way, a different way to find plants through Cowscape. So Cowscape.org, it's a really powerful database of native plants throughout the state of California. And if you look here, 7,988 plants in here. That's like being in the peanut butter aisle of a big grocery store. It's just too many options to choose from, too many things that could go wrong. Because while there is a native plant for pretty much every use and for everywhere in the state, not every plant goes for every use and for everywhere in the state. So what we're trying to do is give you the chance to find the ones that are going to meet what you want or need for your yard that you're most likely to be successful with give you the best chance of growing in the garden that you really want. So you can put in a city. We were talking about Sacramento earlier. So we'll put in Sacramento. Give it just a moment. Sacramento has 414 different native plants. That's a lot still to choose from. That narrows it down a little bit. It doesn't narrow it down quite enough to make a list or to really start planning. So what you can do is go into the advanced search feature up in the top right hand corner there and go into advanced search. And you can choose what it is you're really looking for. Let's say you want annuals, you want perennials, you want a couple of succulents, maybe some shrubs, depending on what you're doing with your yard. You have partial shade and full sun. Uh, you don't even know about your drainage. We'll get into that later. Watering requirements, low or extremely low. We support our water departments and uh, we know that California is once again in drought and will continue to be. Use of care. If it's my yard, I might put moderately easy, but if I'm being realistic, I'm gonna put that I need it to be very, very easy. Um, these ones, babies are going in, they're being paid attention to on, on occasion, but not as often as I should. Um, so we want a bee garden, we want birds, we want butterflies, we want all the good happy things, um, hummingbirds. So there's a lot of options you can choose from. You can see how available is it in nurseries. If you have a favorite nursery already, the fragrance, um, color, when does it flower, how high does it get, what genus is it in? So there's a lot of options for you to choose from. I'm gonna sc scroll slowly. I know scrolling on Zoom can be a little dizzying, and you hit search. Now we're down to 18 plants. So we have 18 plants that meet the needs for what you're looking at. And then it's really about finding what you, what you can envision for your yard. What do you want to wake up to? What do you want to take Instagram photos of? What do you want to have, you know, what are the other needs that you may have for it? There are a lot of really beautiful options here. And if you fall in love with a particular one, Let's say you want this one here, the buckbrush, which obviously a pollinator species. You can go into that one and it will show you in the yellow here on the map, all of the areas that it should do well. And except for a few areas in the Central Valley and along the edges, it goes pretty much everywhere. You can see other pictures of it. You can scroll through a bunch of different photos. You can include photos if you have great photos of ones you have to get a real view of what you might want out of these plants. And then you can learn all about them. You can learn from the wiki version here 
all about the plant, you can see the description for how big is it going to get? What's it gonna look like? How fast is it gonna grow? You can see the wildlife it supports. You can even look at what does it need to thrive? Does it, it needs full sun, it needs very low moisture, always a win, particularly in Sacramento this last couple of weeks. Um, what uh, It's deer resistant, it, it, it's great for bank stabilization. You can look at all these different pieces. You can also go down and print plant signs, you can print plant labels, you could have a very fancy garden that had everything on very cute labels. You can tell everybody about them then. And you can come up here and if you're signed into Cowscape, you can add it to a plant list, which is really useful because then you can go and you can sign up, you can go into a plant list. If I'm going to sign in and add it to one of my plant lists, oops, had to sign in, add it to one of my plant lists. I'm gonna add it to a new plant list and go Sacramento. So I've got a plant list saved there that I can go back to and I can find, I can print out for, to go to a nursery, I can print out to give to my landscape architect. I, whoever you're working with, you can take a list with you. You can go into the nurseries that carry it. You love this plant, you want to find who has it, where can you get it? You go into the nurseries and it will, on this little map here, show you who's carrying it. We were talking about Sacramento, so you can go to one of the Sacramento dots and Corn Flower Farms is carrying it, or Devil Mountain is carrying it. Devil Mountain's a wholesaler. So if you're doing wholesale, that's worth knowing. But wherever you're at, there should be a nursery carrying it. If we were gonna be up in my neck of the woods, California Floral carries it, it gives you a chance to go see their, click to their website, get their phone number, look at their nursery page and plant list, see what else they're carrying. So it's a way to look at how you find the plants you want. If we go back to that full list, a little bit back here. Oh, sorry, it's annoying when it flips like that. But you've got this whole setup that you can go in and you can find. You want, apparently, if you live in Sacramento, doing a whole yellow garden would be a fairly easy thing. You can do a whole purple garden. You can do things that only grow low. You can look for plants that are deer resistant, only grow on the side of a hill and flower in January. You know, those type of things to give you really what you're looking for. So as you're selecting plants, you want to select a whole variety and this is the best way to edit it. And there's one other way to look for plants through this tool. You can, we all know how important pollinators are. You can go into the pollinators piece and find the pollinators that you want to support with your garden. You can go in and decide that you need, I don't know, a painted lady. And then where they're, where they're at and host plants for painted ladies in Sacramento. So it's a great way to work backwards and put together your, your pollinator garden, the pollinator garden of your dreams, of your dream yard. All right, I'm going to come out of the share on this and go back into the slideshow. Let David go back into the slideshow real quick. Great, give me one second here. All right, there's always just a slight lag. Give, hold with us just a moment. And... All right. All right. And on to Maya. Hey, um, thanks so much for that great demonstration and David for sharing all the wonderful photos of plant communities and demonstration gardens and all the ways to get inspired. Um, so I'm gonna dive into getting to know your site and just like the conditions involved with choosing plants. Um, and I think it's really important to take the time to evaluate your site conditions because that will really help you avoid costly mistakes and help you achieve long-term success and sustainability with your garden. So it's really important to think through the planning and take the time to understand your space before diving in and going to your nursery and just buying all the plants um, you want to buy. <laughs> 
I know it's exciting, but it is really important to get to know your site. Um, can you hit next slide, please? So I'm going to go over um, these specific site conditions um, that you need to consider when evaluating your space and choosing plants for your area. Um, and also a little thing to note is don't fight your site. So really, like I just need to reiterate, like getting familiar with your space and take inventory of these four conditions. And you don't want to fight your site and, you know, plant plants that are you know, if you live in a desert climate, but you really want um, a redwood tree or ferns, like don't do that. Um, you know, you really want to just go with nature and go with what's meant in your space. Um, and by knowing what's meant in your space, you need to take the time to evaluate these four conditions. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to first start off in talking about climate. Um, California is generally characterized by a summer dry or otherwise known as Mediterranean climate. So generally wet winters and warm dry summers. Um, and it's really important to choose plants that are adapted to your local climate. Um, as we all know, California, you know, is characterized by this climate, but there's so much variation and variability depending on where you are. Um, like depending on your topography, geography, if you're on the coast versus the foothills or um, in the Sierras, um, these are all things to consider. Um, and also looking into your microclimates, such as wind exposure, uh, fog, salt exposure, if you live by the coast, I'm in the coast. So thinking about that is important. Um, frost and you know when frost comes in your area, these are all things you need to consider. Um, when you are looking into your local climate. Um, next slide, please. Um, another thing to note is sun shade exposure. So one thing to do is to, you know, really observe how the sun moves in your space um, throughout the day. And that also, um, you know, varies by region and season, like the intensity of the sun exposure um, is different in the morning versus in the hot afternoon. Um, and generally, when you are thinking about um, plants and gardening with sun exposure, full sun is at least six hours of sun per day. Um, part sun is around five to six hours and part shade is generally between three to four hours of sun. And if you have less than three hours of sun per day, that's pretty much considered shade um, plants. Um, and another thing to note is when you are choosing your plants, hopefully your plants will grow. Um, so over the years, like if you're choosing a, a heteromelies or a toyon or a larger ceanothus or a, you know any sort of tree, you know an area that was once considered full sun in a few years will become part shade. So that is something to consider as well. Um, and also considering you know, your existing structures and trees and also with um, seasonality, you know, if you're looking, um, observing how the sun moves in a space in the spring when your trees have leafed out versus in the winter when there are obviously aren't any leaves, that's also something to consider as well. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> Um, and soil is a very critical aspect with growing plants. Um, we generally recommend um, getting your soil tested through your local UC Extension or um, other laboratories in your area, just so you can really get to know your soil's comp composition, minerals, and you know any issues or any past owners like treatments of the soil. Um, and that will really make ensure that you have an informed decision about soil amendments and what kind of soil you really have. Um, and, you know, native plants are typically adapted to a native soil. Um, and obviously, garden soils or soils in more urban areas are far from native at this point and have been altered over the years. So it is really important to get to know your soil in that way. Um, and also, you know, your soil might be different throughout your space and it's not the same in, you know, if in one spot in particular, especially if you're like on a hillside or near water. Um, so, you know, getting your soil tested in, in multiple parts of your space is something to consider as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, and last but not least is watering needs. Um, and I'm gonna talk about hydrozoning, which is the concept of grouping plants with similar water needs. Um, 
And in this diagram, it kind of shows with the blue ring, the oasis zone, which is typically 30 to 50 feet um, from your house. Um, and this is the area where, you know, most of your water is available and it's most easily distributed. And obviously like this is just a very general diagram. Like I personally don't have 30 to 50 feet of gardening space around my house. So it's kind of relative to your own space and your own ability to take the time to water. Like I hand water all my plants. So it's just like the closest plants to my watering source is where it's gonna get the most water. And the farther away you go, the less water availability is generally um, available. Um, and yeah, so thinking about like for, let's say if you're just trying to add a few plants to your existing garden, it's important to know how much watering you're um, giving to your plants in your certain areas. So, you know, you match your new plants with your existing plants in the space. Um, which sounds kind of obvious, but it is really important to know. Um, and, you know, plant native plants and containers generally need more water because they're restrictive in their root system. Um, and that's pretty much it for watering. Um, and just like another general tip in terms of choosing plants when you're in your nursery or at a plant sale or wherever you get your plants, um, it's great to grow plants in clumps. Um, to like imitate nature and entice pollinators. And, you know, just to have like a cohesive swath of the sim same plant is just aesthetically looks nice. Um, makes your space feel cohesive. And um, that's just another thing to note when you're choosing plants in your space. Yeah, and don't, I think another thing to watch out for too is to choose plants that are gonna take about the same water requirements. Cause sometimes you might think two plants look fabulous together, but in reality, one might not really not be very, you know, uh, thirsty. You might be planting a flannel bush next to, um, I don't know, a uh, carex or, you know, essentially choosing like, or like a wetland plant. So essentially don't plant plants together that have different water needs because they're not gonna be happy. <laughs> so it's just best in that drift mentality, helps because you're really filling out sections of the yard with similar water requirements. Yeah, yeah, thanks for reiterating that. That's very important and it's something that I think people can easily overlook, but it is really, yeah, very critical just to group plants with similar watering needs. And I think with Calscape, which is great, you can, in the advanced settings, I think Anne-Marie went over, um, you can choose the watering needs for the specific plants. So, um, I guess it's just like you want to group your plants with obviously the si similar sunshade exposure and watering needs. Um, so yeah, I think those, all these conditions go hand in hand. Um, Beautiful. And yeah, the further out you go, you know, you want to most likely just plant native plants that can just withstand um, annual rainfall after establishment. Um, that just, just to make your life easier. So you don't have to walk beyond 50 feet from, <laughs> from your space to water. Or, uh, you know, I guess if you're, you know, have um, irrigation, then it's a different story, but. Great. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> wow, we burned through that. <laughs> I know. We're yeah. through that. We've had a lot of different <laughs> questions coming in. Okay, and, great. <laughs> and so there've been quite a few on all types of different things in, um, and I'm just asking some of them we'll go with doing it live um, advice on what to plant in the drip line for mature trees and I know that and there was another one earlier about trees that are deciduous so you're having trees where you have full sun part of the year and partial and full shade the rest of the year and that can vary so much by tree and by type like oaks don't like to have anything planted under them that needs to be um, irrigated in the summer. Yeah. Anything that, that needs summer water, they don't, they don't want to be part of that. They don't like being watered um, unless they're in extreme drought. It, always situations. Um, and these are, these are kind of very specific parts, but under trees and in um, drip lines, any, any good advice on that? Yeah, there, there's some great plants and, and one day we'll, we'll probably do a write-up on it, but there's some great plants that handle such a great variety of conditions. A couple that come to mind are coffee berry, which is frangula, 
Um, barberry, actually, and there's lots of uh, barberry species in California. The, the genus is Berberus. But those, yeah. those plants are fabulous because they handle such a wide range of conditions. I've seen them under oaks. I've seen them under a number of different types of trees, but I've also seen them wide out open in the chaparral. And of course, depending on the, the factors at play there, if it's full sun and not a lot of water, the coffee berry is gonna be smaller and more contained, but if, if it's under an oak, it might kind of look fabulously lush. So I love these plants that can kind of fit a lot of different planting situations. The mm -hmm. ones that immediately come to mind for me are the coffee berry, the barberry, and if you have the space, toyon. Toyon occurs through so many parts of the state and it can be used out in the sunniest hillside in Southern California, but it can also grow in the understory of redwoods. So it's a really amazing plant. It's one of our most sublimely beautiful native plants because it has these red berries in the winter and white flowers in the summer, evergreen, holly-like leaves, um, great habitat plant. I'm, I'm like, I'm on a soapbox for toyon right now, but it's, you know, I basically just want to say that there's quite a number of plants that uh, are great for these very interchangeable conditions and are even great too to consider in an urban environment where the, the shadows of buildings will really change throughout the year. So those are just a few of some really great versatile plants. Those yeah. are some so Also plants. ribes, I feel like is great, um, mm -hmm. even under oaks, um, just something yeah. else. Yeah, yeah. Juncus too. Juncus is this yeah. beautiful reed, reed-like plant. There's a number of different species, but it's even though it just looks like you know it looks like it's emerging out of a wetland, which of course it does like water, uh, because it's evolved here in California in in certain contexts. It's actually fairly drought tolerant, so it it can grow and look really nice even if it's not in like standing water or not receiving that much supplemental income, or <laughs> supplemental uh, irrigation depending on the context it's in. <laughs> That's income for these plants. There you go, income. Yeah, there you go. How about, we've had a couple of questions on soils. Um, there's a bunch on getting them tested, but also like when they're growing them through, they're getting them through chapter sales or when they're getting them in a nursery, they've been grown in some form of really good conditions. They've usually have great soil, they've had you know, everything balanced for them. And then we're taking them home, we're putting them into soil that is often not native soil. They don't have a lot of native mycelium perhaps. Um, so people, are, we have at least one question on, does using your own soil and growing from seeds make them more successful? And in my experience that can help growing ones that are local to your watershed in, in your area might be really good, but you can also feed your soil. Um, you can, um, you know, add a, adding compost or compost tea, particularly if you have soil that's been developed and redeveloped for years or was perhaps um, not always fed and over, you know, planted in ways that took up a lot of the nutrients in it. If you feed your soil and establish really good soil life, you can grow things from the nurseries a lot better and the seeds a lot better. What is your experience, David and Maya? I mean, I feel like it really depends on the plant, honestly. Um, yeah. I mean, native plants, what, what's, that, what's really amazing about them is they're, they're very resilient. Uh, they, they don't typically require a lot of amendments unless you're in that circumstance where the soil has been very developed. Um, and in, in most cases, what you'll find is that even though a plant might be taking a very long time to get established, like a couple of years, and, and you might kind of jump to a conclusion that it's the soil, um, it could be a factor, but in reality, these native plants are, are putting their roots down and, and kind of getting a foothold. And at a certain point, uh, hopefully, they'll, they'll take off. So um, it, it's not always the soil, um, but it, it also comes down to, you know, just like everything, just like the whole theme of this webinar, it's choosing the right plants. Um, for instance, there's alluvial soil that comes off of, of our mountains, especially down in the San Gabriel Mountains where I was living in Claremont. And that soil is, is almost like concrete, it's sand. <laughs> but specific plants evolved in, the, in that context, like you know, white sage or yucca or buckwheat, they're fine with that. Whereas like a lot of the other ornamental plants people are trying to plant there struggle and just require tons of supplemental irrigation. So soil is, is probably a topic we'll one day just cover for an hour because there's so much you can talk about. Yeah. 
I think that was really well said. I don't have much else to add to that. I think, yeah, I mean, ideally you would get your water, your soil tested. Um, just and if they're getting their soil tested recommendations on what they should be getting tested, do you have any on those? I think generally with the extension, they just, I think you ask for like a, I don't, I don't know if you can really go super specifically. I think they just test for your pH and whatever mineral contents are in your soil. Um, you can also have like your, you can do, you know, your own soil drainage test. I think we have all put in the chat some resources that we have about um, prepping um, your site and soil um, that goes more into, you know, a soil drainage test that you can do at home and ribbon testing as well. Um, yeah, I'll put it in right now. Yeah, as, an, as the first thing to do, ribbon testing or a drainage test is always a good start. You know, feeling your soil, feeling if it'll be, make clay, if it feels too sandy. You know, how long is it, if you dig a hole, how long does it take to drain? And really knowing what that looks like will help you when you're looking for, you know, for what your soil will take. Um, there are a lot of various questions coming in quickly. We're trying to kind of group them, obviously. And a lot of these topics we'll get to in the next few months. One of the things that we're going to be doing is starting kind of a horticulture 101 that will intersperse with this naturehood. Um, and like next month, we will be doing one on going much more into detail on to how to choose plants. We'll be going into a, a little bit more professional level that'll cover some more of these pieces as well. So if we don't get to it tonight, we'll have an opportunity next month to look into it deeper too. Cause I see the questions just rolling in faster than I can do sometimes. And also I'm putting in our gardening at CNPS email that me and Anne Marie manage where we can dive a little bit deeper when we have more time to um, give you some resources can, that can point you in the right direction. Um, How um, about for street trees? Mm. Street, yeah, you know, city street trees in particular are a challenging life for a tree. I think we've all seen that done poorly. Do either of you have favorite street trees? Or do people who want to be in the chat have recommendations for street trees? Yeah, I'd love to hear in the chat, yeah. yeah. I know uh, this is something that cities struggle with all over the state and probably all, much farther than that. Yeah, I mean, I of course wave the flag of oaks, like plant an oak tree. <laughs> There's such a fabulous habitat uh, plant, they're, they're foundational. And so then there's oaks in so many ecosystems across California. Um, so in, in almost every plant community, you, you can probably find an oak tree. Uh, and, and those are really resilient. Um, there's other trees, you know, like I love sycamores, Western sycamores uh, down in Southern California and parts of the state where you have this really nice seasonality where in the summer, these Western sycamores are leafed out in the winter they go deciduous. And so in the kind of colder, if you can even call it colder parts of Southern California's year, you you want that sun and that's when the sycamores kind of provide it as they lose their leaves. So that's that's a that's a beautiful tree with kind of a white uh, white bark. Um, yeah, any, any ideas? Buckeyes also are a great one, can be a good one depending on where you're at. But oaks, um, Doug Tellamy has a whole thing how oaks are, I think it's 270 species are reliant on oaks. So if you're looking for biodiversity, we can't really get better than an oak. Um, do you have any favorite ones, Maya? Um, I really like red buds. Oh yeah. Buckeyes too are beautiful. I think they're great street, street trees as well because they don't get too tall. Um, yeah, oaks as well. Um, yeah, I feel like those are my top three. Yeah, I think it depends too where you're at and what does a street tree mean for you? If you're in a tiny little park with an oak is obviously not your, your choice. It's going to get too big. It depends on you know where you're at, what your size limitations are, all those types of things. Um, if you're in an area that doesn't allow trees near the street, um, the city of Long Beach is doing a great thing with um, with parkways, replanting parkways into native gardens. Mm -hmm. 
And I think just to reiterate, I think it's really important. Like I said earlier, like don't fight your site. Like I think, especially with soil and climate and water, like really just take note of what you have in your space. And you, if you have like a really sandy soil, like you can find native plants that thrive in sandy soils um, versus clay soils. Um, you know, I think that's really important to just reiterate. Um, just yeah. to try to find plants that fit your space. Yeah, and some of the tips that we've talked about time and again in this webinar series, and we'll be talking about it forever, um, things to consider when you're doing gardening and landscape design with native plants, but with virtually any plant, is think about what the what the landscape will look like at maturity. Um, I, I suffer from this all the time. I plant far too many plants in this space because I want that instant gratification. Um, but be cognizant of how big these plants are going to get. Um, so, so make sure you, that information is available on Calscape. It's often available on the plant labels um, when you're at nurseries, but if not, jump on your, your, your smartphone um, and, and look up how big it's going to get. Uh, Cause it's so tempting to fill out your whole garden and, you know, oh wait, Twyon is, you know, 15 feet in diameter uh, or bigger. So think, think about kind of that end goal. And my recommendation with that too is, Intersperse with annuals, you know, while you're impatient like me and waiting for your garden to mature, sow some annuals and that will kind of fill in the gaps of your baby garden as you wait for things to mature. But that's a great way to look at it. I was taught by somebody who liked over planting and then pulling out and it's so much more work. That's a much better way to do it. Yeah, yeah. How about climate change? We have, um, we have a lot of places in California that are that get really hot because of you know urbanization, and we, we're seeing climate change. And we have somebody asking about warmer, drier futures, and I think mm -hmm. we have all the plant. My perspective would be that the plants that are there have developed with that region. Um, they've developed for the precipitation that happens in that space. They've developed co-evolved with the, with the pollinators, with the microbes in the soil, with everything that is in that area. And then it's still the best choice for those. Um, the best thing I think we could do for climate change would be to plant more, um, mm. to plant more trees, to plant more native grasses that will get deep roots and take up a lot of that, um, to do anything we can to feed the soils that will help with the, with the soil health. How about you all? Yeah, I, I noticed that my time at, at California Botanic Garden, that, that, that institution is, had been in Claremont since the 50s and some of the early plant collections, you know, it's in, in very close to the Inland Empire um, in Southern California. So you're getting into, in towards the interior, it's still considered chaparral and coastal sage scrub to some degree, but you're getting into hotter temperatures, right? Um, and so some of the plant, uh, uh, acquisitions early on in the garden's history had been conifers um, from some of the higher elevations in the San Gabriels, um, some more coastal plants. And what the horticulture team and a lot of us re were realizing is that there was a trend in, in climate change and as temperatures increased, you know, we had the 118 degree day there about two, two or three years ago um, where it just crippled plants. But you know what, what survived and, and was very resilient were the site native species. Um, so, you know, yes, the garden's scope is to present native plants from across the, the state and the California floristic province. But the plants that were site native, of course, like, you know, like I mentioned some at the top, white sage, chaparral yucca, the California buckwheat, uh, some of our pen stemmons, uh, those ones, you know, were mostly unscathed. But when you, when you think about climate change, it becomes even more important to plant those plants that are going to be able to weather uh, some of these uh, really severe, you know, uh, hot temperature days, uh, the, the kind of prolonged conditions of drought. Those are the plants that are going to um, have the best chance, I think, uh, of, of being resilient. Well, and with climate change, we're not only getting the heat wave we've just been experiencing in some parts of the state, we're getting bigger storms. Mm -hmm. We're getting more randomization in our weather patterns, um, more weird, more weirding. And usually the plants that are 
native there are going to withhold that. I are going to stand up to that better. I live along a creek. Um, and so whatever is planted when we do flood and we're starting to, to both go dry more often and flood more often, when we flood, seeds from everything come down. Um, unfortunately, right now, that means a lot of invasive species. But if we can keep those out and continue planting natives, it at least when it's spreading things in those ways, is going to be spreading more natives. We're going to see more flooding in the coming years. Yeah. All right, um, well, do you want to do like maybe one more question and then I can tie it up? Absolutely. Um, there are still so many coming in. It's a lot of really great questions too. Unfortunately, we're having a, a lot of um, a lot of pieces on that. Uh, let's see. I think we've had a couple on things that are in there that you know, both non-natives, invasives, uh, diseases. But there's also been a lot on seeds. How to harvest or grow from seeds. And, you know, for somebody who's just starting growing from seeds, do you have any good tips? I think. <laughs> I'm going to come right out and say that I am the suckiest propagator that you'll ever meet. So <laughs> I, I just buy the best. Um, but there are some amazing people propagating. I, I don't know, Maya, do you have insight? Yeah, I mean, a little bit. I wouldn't consider myself a seed. I like collecting seeds more than germinating native seeds. I've, I've had mixed results with uh, germinating seeds or native seeds. Um, I, would, I would suggest, um, I think maybe, I mean, I don't know if I feel obliged, but Amy is a great resource at CNPS. She runs the treasure hunt program um, at CNPS and she has a lot of experience um, with native seed collecting and growing natives from seed. I can um, put her email in the chat as well. Um, so and the terms are, so prop, yeah, the terms uh, germinating, it's just like starting um, plants from seed and generally propagating, I kind of assume is like taking a cutting from an existing plant um, and then um, rooting it from there. Um, and that's usually with woody vegetation. Kit also and had a great idea that there is a California native plant propagation page on Facebook. Oh, great. So, and what I would recommend is to get them from a reputable source, get them from somebody who is growing their own plants to get seeds or is doing it legally, ethically, sustainably, um, because there are people who sometimes sell seeds that they have harvested um, without proper permits and that can mess with biodiversity in the wilderness as well. So checking your sources a bit is important. Um, and then somebody asked to, uh, on, on both sides about the yellow and blue dots on the Calscape site maps. And I'm going to defer because I can't see the colors very well, so. Yellow and blue dots, just just like a, an error that's popping up. No, on the I think it's on the map part in Cowscape. I can see yellow, but I can't see any blue dots. I'm not sure. I think yellow is all the area that that plant is found in, and I'm not sure what the blue dots are. So since it was asked on both sides, I figured. Yeah, yellow is the range. Um, blue is confirmed sighting. Somebody had that. Great. Okay. All right. Perfect. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for attending. We'll send a follow up email uh, after tonight with some more resources and a recording of the webinar. Um, and I just, of course, want to direct everyone to try Calscape out. Um, and if it seems a little daunting at first, I recommend trying the Cowscape Garden Planner, which you can find on that site. And then buy native plants. So a lot of our chapter sales have wound down, but we have native plant nursery partners across the state. And you can find those on Cowscape, like uh, Anne-Marie demonstrated. Uh, there's a nursery uh, tab there that you can find nurseries that 
uh, are near you and can you, you can even kind of figure out which ones carry the plants that you want. Um, also, just to plug like great time, it's not the best time to buy. Yeah, plants. true, this true. Is yes. This is a great time to spend time in your garden and just take notes and be outside in your space all day and looking how the water flows and how the sun casts a shadow or how trees cast a shadow in your space. Now is a great time to plan for the fall when you can Yes, thanks, Maya. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I was going to say, now is the time to obsessively dream. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm inspired. Yeah. You know, it's a great way to look at it. Yeah, go out in your garden, uh, get familiar with your site, test some of these tools, and, and uh, find inspiration. So visit some public gardens, visit wildlands, um, and just kind of go through some of those online resources like the 360 tour so you can see plants in context. So obsessively dream away and we'll be offering some more webinars in the like Henry said in the coming months to to get everyone ready as we excitedly pursue the best time of the year which is fall planting season so yeah and we are available as a resource as well feel free to reach out to us if if you have more when you have more questions beautiful all right well thank you everybody thank you, we'll see you soon. Yeah.